good day. As we approach the end of the year, easing headline inflation and modest economic growth remain the dominant global economic trends of this past year. Output in the euro area is poor, while the robust growth seen in North America is likely to moderate. China's growth performance is still weak, with few benefits for global commodity prices. Across most regions, monetary policy will continue to focus on achieving inflation targets, while high debt levels will require fiscal consolidation efforts. In the developing world, financing conditions are expected to remain tight and growth moderate. The longer-term economic outlook, however, remains uncertain. Weaker household consumption and falling property prices may be a drag on growth for a sustained period. Climate change and geopolitical tensions threaten supply chains, output, and prices. With high interest rates and uncertainty, financial markets and asset prices are expected to remain volatile dampening investor appetite and capital flows. Taking these and other factors into account, the SAP's forecast for global growth in 2023 is broadly unchanged at 2.7% and 2.6% in 2024. While South Africa's electricity load shedding has declined, domestic growth in the near term is likely to remain muted. Energy and logistical constraints are still binding on economic activity and generally increase costs. We, however, expect electricity supply to increase gradually over the medium term, helping to raise our forecast for output growth in 2024, 2025, and 2026. Spending by firms, households, Public corporations and general government remains positive in real terms on an annual basis. Disposable income of households is expected to grow, albeit slowly. This in the, the investment forecast for the year was revised up to 7.7% in September. Credit growth to households and corporates has slowed in recent months but remains positive. GDP growth for 2023 is revised slightly upward to 0.8% from the September figure of 0.7%. Our GDP growth forecast for 2024 and 2023 is increased from the previous meeting to 1.2% and 1.3% respectively, in large part due to an expected decrease in load shedding. While households and firms exhibit some resilience, economic growth has been volatile and highly sensitive to new shocks. A sustained reduction in load shedding or greater energy supply from alternative sources would significantly increase growth. The operation of ports and rail, however, have become a serious constraint. At present, we assess the risks to the medium-term domestic growth outlook to be balanced as demand continues to run ahead of the constrained supply environment. As a result, our current growth forecast leaves the output gap marginally positive. Turning to the inflation outlook, South Africa's headline inflation rate has increased more gradually than in many other emerging and advanced economies. Nonetheless, South Africa's inflation rate remains sensitive to shocks. So while volatile in recent weeks, oil prices have increased over the year and commodity export prices have moderated further. South Africa's external financing needs will increase as the current account deficit expands from a forecasted 1.3% of GDP this year to 
2.6% of GDP in 2024 and to 3.5% of GDP in 2025. The smaller deficit this year is the result of significantly better than expected trade outcomes in the third quarter. The rent weakened over the past year, depreciating by about 9.5% against the US dollar. The lack of sustained economic growth and dependence on commodities is reflected in the high volatility of the currency in response to global risk on and risk off episodes. The implied starting point for the rent forecast is 18 rent 76 cents to the US dollar compared to 18 rents 45 cents at the time of the previous meeting. Compared to September, fuel price inflation is broadly unchanged for 2023, but lowered from 5.8% to 3.2% in 2024. Our food price inflation forecast for 2023 remains high at 10.6%. The forecast for 2024 is slightly higher at 5.5%. Better monthly outcomes have led to a marginal downward revision in our forecast for core inflation to 4.8% in 2023 and to 4.6% in 2024. The core inflation forecast for 2025 remains at 4.5%. The new 2026 core forecast is also 4.5%. Services inflation in 2023 is now expected to come in at 4.3% before rising to 4.8% in 2024. Core goods inflation remains elevated, but is revised lower for this year to 6%. Growth in average salaries and unit labor costs is forecast to be somewhat lower than at the time of the September meeting. With few significant changes to underlying components, headline inflation for 2023 is revised down slightly to 5.8%. The forecast for headline inflation for 2024 is 5% before stabilizing at 4.5% in 2025 and 20. 26. While our baseline inflation forecast has improved, risks to the inflation outlook are still assessed to the upside. Even as global headline inflation moderates, oil markets remain tight and core inflation sticky. Despite recent easing in some food price components, Domestic food price inflation remains volatile and increased in October to 8.7%. El Nino conditions present longer-term concerns. Imported goods inflation has increased over the year and despite slightly better recent outcomes, remains sensitive to currency weakness. Electricity prices continue to present clear inflation risks and with logistics constraints are likely to have broader effects on the cost of doing business and the cost of living. Given uncertain food and fuel price inflation, considerable risk still attaches to the forecast for average salaries. Sticky inflation implies that average policy rates in major economies will remain high at about 4.3% in 2024 compared to the 1.1% average rate in 2022. These tighter global financial conditions will raise the risk profile of economies needing foreign capital. Sharply lower tax revenue higher employee compensation, and ongoing financing needs of state-owned enterprises are expected to keep South Africa's long-term cost of borrowing elevated. 
Despite an expected moderation in inflation, long-term bond yields currently trade around 12%. Higher inflation has generally resulted in elevated inflation expectations across markets, businesses, and households. Market-based expectations for inflation in 2023 are currently at 5.8% while near-term break-even rates have dipped to 4.3%. Medium and longer-term market expectations for inflation remain elevated. The September survey of the Bureau for Economic Research shows average inflation expectations lower at 6.1% for 2023. The committee, however, would prefer to see the expectations anchored at the midpoint of the inflation targeting range. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to keep the repurchase rate at the current level of 8.25% per year. The decision was unanimous. At the current repurchase rate level, policy is restrictive consistent with the inflation outlook and elevated inflation expectations. Serious upside risks to the inflation outlook remain. In light of these risks, the committee remains vigilant and stands ready to act should risks begin to materialize. Decisions will continue to be data dependent and sensitive to the balance of risks to the outlook. The inflation and repo rate projections from the updated QPM remain a broad policy guide, changing from meeting to meeting in response to new data and risks. The policy stance aims to anchor inflation expectations more firmly around the midpoint of the target bend and to increase confidence of attaining the inflation target sustainably over time. The MPC will seek to look through temporary price shocks and focus on potential second round effects and the risks of de-anchoring inflation expectations. Guiding inflation back towards the midpoint of the target bend reduces the economic cost of high inflation and will achieve lower interest rates in the future. Since early 2020, the committee has recommended additional means of lowering inflation that are within the reach of the public sector. These include achieving a prudent public debt level, increasing the supply of energy, keeping administered price inflation low, and real wage growth in line with productivity gains. Such steps would strengthen monetary policy effectiveness and its, effectiveness and its transmission to the broader uh, economy. That concludes uh, our statement, and we would now be taking questions. And as usual, uh, please identify yourself and uh, the media house that you represent. Afternoon, Governor and Deputy Governors. Tana Anders from Reuters. I have four questions. Um, to start off, the committee, is the committee surprised by how quickly inflation ticked up in October? Secondly, the committee has said that inflation is likely to sit at the target range's midpoint in 2025. How could this be challenged by the October headline figure released yesterday and the deterioration of port and rail operations? Thirdly, how significant or likely are the risks that inflation might once again break the upper limit of the target range? And finally, what does this show about the underlying inflationary pressures? Thank you.
Did you say Tanya? Okay, thank you. Um, it's Togozo Kumalo from Newsroom Africa. Just outside of the announcement, the story that South Africa is talking about is the whole issue around the RAND manipulation probe. Um, could the SARP give us their view on the un ongoing um, or the probe that concluded last week uh, by the Competition Commission? And will SARP institute its own investigation or prosecutions? One more. Good afternoon, Governor and your panel. Uh, my name is Dando Tukwana from Bloomberg News. Um, Governor, in the lead up to uh, the Finance Minister's medium term budget update, um, there were some fiscal concerns that were um, flagged and the potential impact it would have on borrowing costs. What's your response to the Minister's update um, this, earlier this month? And will the budget cuts that he announced alleviate some pressure on monetary policy? Okay. Uh, Ntokozo, the MPC didn't discuss any allegations of uh, uh, rent manipulation. Um, if you are interested in what we think, we will address that once we have dealt with the business of the MPC. Tando from Bloomberg responds to the Minister of Finance on the, uh, the update, we really got consent with fiscal policy to the extent that it would influence the country risk premium and so forth. Um, if you were to ask the Minister of Finance what his response is to the MPC's updated forecast, he will send you back to us. So if you would like to know anything about the budget, I suggest you speak to the Minister of Finance. Tanya, um, surprise of uh, the inflation uh, uptick. Uh, the uptick in, inf uh, in inflation is uh, unwelcome. Um, uh, but we had highlighted that there were risks to the inflation outlook and that they are uh, on the upside. And we saw that uh, uh, coming, uh, occurring. But again, in the same manner that we were surprised by inflation going down to 4.7%, and we said we can't respond to that, we also can't be responding to an uptick uh, in uh, inflation. What is important for you to note is the trajectory of the forecast that we are still expecting with that inflation this year will come out at 5.8%, which is marginally lower than what we were thinking uh, at the time of the previous meeting, even if it is by just 0.1%. The point here is that you cannot respond to monthly figures. You have got to respond to what you see within the policy, uh, the policy um, uh, horizon. We still assess the, even after that figure that the risks of the inflation outlook are to the upside. And should we think that these risks might materialize, we stand ready to recalibrate policy to make inflation down to uh, the midpoint of the inflation target range. We do, however, believe that the current policy stance is in restrictive territory and is consistent with the uh, inflation outlook that we are having, barring any of those risks uh, uh, materializing. Uh, do we think that there are risks that it could breach the uh, 6 uh, uh, percent? It is not in our baseline, but with risks to the upside and inflation having climbed to uh, 5.9, um, that risk, one can say, but it might happen. And um, uh, it might just be saying to us that the risks to the inflation outlook that we had identified are thus materializing. Just to put things into context, the 5.9 outcome was just 0.3% uh, above what the Reserve Bank was expecting for that particular uh, 
uh, for the month of October. Um, target, uh, we expect that we will come back to target uh, sustainably in uh, 2025. Uh, there might be months uh, during 2024 where inflation could actually be at 45 so when that happens, don't get excited and say that, oh, so is it now time uh, to do something opposite? Understand that. We do have an idea of what the outcome for each of the months would be. But for us, what is important is what is the momentum of the inflation? Is it a sustained momentum towards the target or away from the target? And if it is a sustained momentum away from the target, we stand ready to deploy our tools to bring it back uh, towards, uh, 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 towards the, uh, the target. What were the underlying inflationary uh, uh, pressures? When we try to measure the inflationary pressures, we try and strip out the volatile items like food and fuel so that we can arrive at what we call core inflation. Our forecast for core inflation has actually shown that core inflation has declined uh, this year and that it will remain around the midpoint of the uh, inflation uh, target range. That is one measure that says to us that um, the inflationary pressures have not quite spread from the two volatile, three volatile items being food, fuel, and uh, uh, electricity. However, Bear in mind that even the pressures in those volatile uh, items could spread into the core and thus lead to a resurgence of inflation. And it is important for us uh, to, watch, uh, to watch that. The other aspect to consider is that we do not see elevated demand side pressures in the economy at the moment. The nature of the inflation had been, in the main, supply shocks. But even supply shocks had proved that they could feed into inflation, which is why we had been acting throughout uh, this period. And we had come to this point where we uh, actually believe that um, Policy is sufficiently restrictive, is consistent with our outlook that we got to be now in a risk-based approach and identify those risks that could derail us from achieving the target of 4.5%, and that should those risks threaten to materialize, we should actually act to deal with them. Any other questions? We will not make progress because everybody is saying after you. <laughs> uh, Governor, one, one MPC-related question and two others for you to uh, pick up at the end. Um, on the MPC, when you talk about sufficiently restrictive, um, I'm looking at um, are you working on a neutral real rate, which if I look a year ahead looks at about 2.5% looking one year ahead. Um, so does that mean that in theory, if nothing changes, you can stop now? And how would we know when we were heading into a potential cutting cycle? In other words, at what point does monetary policy become too restrictive, if you like? And the two non-MPC related ones, the first is, um, have you had any word on the um, resignation of Deputy Governor Nayadu. Have you heard anything from the presidency? And the second, um, I don't want to ask about the bank's uh, case, which is still up and running at the competition authorities and could be for a while, but I did notice from the Bank for International Settlements, um, from the, their figures, their latest figures, that trade in the RAND, in the uh, rand exchange rate globally has declined quite a bit over the past years. Um, and I wondered if, if this is a concern for the SOB. 
and what it reflects. Thank you. Kapalogumbi from Reuters. Uh, two quick questions. My first is, is this still just a pause or can we consider this to be the end of the hiking cycle? Um, and then secondly, your, the rate path forecast looks like there could be cuts in the early part of 2024. Is that still possible, likely, or as some economists have predicted, could we see rates being cut only towards the second half of 2024? Oh, third question, sorry. <laughs> third question, what do, you, what do long-term bond yields, you say although the mod, there is a moderation in inflation, you see it, but bond yields remain quite high. What does that tell you about the health of the economy and how you navigate monetary policy going forward? Thanks. Afternoon, Governor. My name is Tembile Tele with Bloomberg News. Uh, on the MPC, it currently has five members, but it can go up to seven. I just wonder if there is any consideration to adding new members, um, and if not, what might the conditions be under which you would make such a consideration? And then on Deputy Governor Kasim's favorite topic, uh, Chief Ekra, are you able to confirm uh, what National Treasury has said, that it is in talks or consultation uh, with yourselves about a potential withdrawal? Um, and also, are you at the point of which you might have an idea of what cost would be involved uh, to the bank to facilitate that? Um, and maybe a balance also on, on that account as of today, how much it is. As of today. Bank, as of today. <laughs> Thank you. Is that it? Okay. Um, Hillary, um, monetary policy restrictiveness and nature, I'd say to you that um, uh, is restrictive as it stands now. There are things that might change that might look, make it look non-restrictive or less restrictive. Bear in mind in calculating neutral real rate, we take account of foreign neutral rates and we take account of the country risk premium. If those move higher, those two move higher, it means South Africa's neutral rate, real rate is higher. That would mean it's like we are having now at 8.25, that you are no longer looking as restrictive as you were before that had moved, because the calculation of restrictiveness here will be the difference in the real policy rate and the real neutral, uh, re real neutral uh, rate. That is uh, the one. There is another aspect. The other aspect that is used is that there are a number of people, uh, even here at home, who will calculate what is called the financial conditions index. And the financial conditions, con uh, conditions index would then tell us whether it is considered that financing conditions are restrictive or are accommodative. Uh, that is another aspect. But these financial conditions uh, indices are uh, tricky. Uh, they are driven by all sorts of uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, but that is the one uh, aspect that uh, you, uh, you look at. Uh, others just take the straightforward and says the repo is at 8.25. We expect uh, inflation to be 4.5 by uh, uh, 2025. Uh, that's 24 months ahead. And at 4.5, uh, 8.25, that suggests that monetary policy is restrictive to the extent that you have got real rates of 3.75. But that is just looking at, at us. There is the other aspect that you consider. Because global financial conditions are tight and could tighten, relative interest rates also matter, especially where you are running twin deficits because you have got to attract 
uh, capital, and that becomes a factor there. So you have got to consider all of those to tell you uh, the extent of the restrictiveness. The BIS uh, trade in decline in the rent, uh, I've not quite looked at the most recent uh, figures. All that I, the figure that I had was that South African rent share is about 1% of the global at, at, at turnover. It is more than our share of uh, GDP. Uh, to the extent that it declines, I think that we also get to take into account that there are other currencies entering the space. Uh, the RMB previously was not much traded. It is entering the space and it's starting to occupy uh, the space. We watch, we watch those, and um, I don't know if DG Kasim would want to add at some stage. He sits in a BIS committee called the Markets Committee. Their job is to worry about uh, those, uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those things. Ms. Gumbi, uh, oh, no, yeah, your question about this, this, the end of the hiking cycle links to what Hillary had asked about at what point would we see um, a, a deadline in rates? And it just sometimes just strikes me that you seem to be thinking that the purpose of policy is to target rates. We don't target interest rates. We target inflation. So if you want to know where interest rates are going, look at where inflation is going. For the lower the inflation, the lower the interest rates you would have. And if inflation is creeping up, that means when you are having higher inflation, expect that there would be higher uh, inflation, uh, higher interest rates. We spell stuff in the QPM, and as we continuously uh, remind you, the path Embedded in the QPM is a guideline that changes from meeting to meeting in response uh, to data. It does become sometimes a bit volatile, moving to this quarter or to that quarter. Um, we do not go and f religiously follow uh, the QPM. It is a guide. Because if we were to religiously follow it, uh, we could just well just fire the MPC and allow the QPM to take the decisions. Um, that is not what we are about to do. And as such, to the extent the QPM says there might be cuts uh, on in this quarter or that quarter, take it that it is a guide. The MPC must make its decision. And the input from the QPM is just but one uh, input uh, in addition to uh, all the others. Economists expecting uh, rate uh, cuts you know, this is uh, the thing about being a, uh, a central banker. There isn't a shortage of advice. And in South Africa, there are 60 million people out there uh, with uh, an idea of what they think uh, we should do. And, um, and it is good for a, uh, for a discourse. But at the end of the day, we have got the statutory responsibility to tackle inflation and bring price stability and we have got to be seen to be acting uh, in that manner. Uh, and, and you know, the, all those economists, you must know, they are actually paid fairly well. And they are paid well to try and predict what they think we are going to do. And most of the time, uh, it becomes a thin edge. Are they saying these things because that is what they would like us to do? or they are saying it because they think that is what we are going to do. And our job here is to communicate consistent messages so that you could almost say we can see where they are uh, going in a way, providing some level of certainty. We can't provide 100% certainty because we are operating in a very uncertain environment. Bond yields remaining elevated. What does this tell us about the state of the economy? They do not tell us much about the state of the uh, uh, economy, but they might be telling us much about the state of public finances and the concerns thereof. When you look globally, yield curves have steepened. And so the compensation investors 
ask for to lend you money for a longer period of time has gone up. Your colleagues in your, in your newsroom call it term premium. So term premium has gone up. And term premium has gone up is a reflection of the global state of public finances. In other words, what we have seen happening with public debt in various jurisdictions, including the advanced, uh, the advanced economies. And in South Africa, we have also seen that as our debt goes up, as our deficit goes up, that term premium goes up. But in our case, we had also at one stage had a big shift upwards of our yield curve. After the MTBPS, that yield curve had come down uh, uh, lower. Again, reflecting what the lenders in the capital markets think of the trajectory of public finances in South Africa, but also comparing South Africa to alternative investment destinations that the investors could be lending uh, those to. Uh, Rasha, do you want to add anything on the markets thing before I get to the uh, thing? Yeah. Just to say that, um, uh, you know, one, one shouldn't interpret the decline in rent turnover uh, in the same way that you decline, uh, interpret the decline in uh, our share of global trade. Uh, that by any measure uh, of GDP, South Africa re remains uh, a highly uh, traded currency. We have a very deep capital markets, and relative to the size of the economy, uh, for our foreign exchange turnover by all standards of emerging market is still is still is still one of, one of the one of the highest. I think part of the turnover depends on whether you're talking of the spot, the futures, the swap market. But I think, as the governor said, some of the declines is not that our they not necessarily an absolute decline, but other currencies are entering the fray. Other countries are developing much more deeper uh, capital market. By, but the RAND, by far, is a proxy turnover. It's highly traded relative to the size of the economy. OK. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, it's said that uh, um, we do not appoint ourselves into positions. And times come uh, when uh, your term is up, and um, the appointing authority might decide they are not reappointing you. And that is fine. A time also comes where, even when you have appointed, been appointed, you can say to the appointing authority, I think that I have served enough. It's time for me to go. And you have those conversations with the appointing authority. And that is what uh, DG Naidu has done. But like uh, conversations between the governor and the president, conversations between the deputy governor and the president remain conversations between the deputy governor and the president. I'm sure she can, he can say to you, he met the president, but he will not give you the content of what they discussed. OK. Um, that, that helps him and takes him uh, off the hook. Um, MPC uh, members, yes, we will be adding. Um, can't quite say what I'm, we have been on a long hunt. Uh, the hunt is still on, um, and then we will appoint. Uh, Tembi Le, um, G. Fekra. You know, let, I just want to make sure that you do not all say that uh, we leave from here and they say that uh, the reason why the treasury is not being paid this money is because it's that deputy governor. So let me see whether what I say is consistent what, with what you have heard him say before. Jifakra, the Gold and Foreign Exchange Contingency Reserve Account is a consolidation of three accounts. The gold price adjustment account, the foreign exchange adjustment account, and the forward exchange contract account. Each one of those three accounts in any given year can make a loss or a profit. The gold price adjustment account would be a profit from the trading of gold the forward exchange account is from 
forwards and swaps, and the foreign exchange one is from spot transactions. Those balances get swept into the GFECRA. But GFECRA profits or losses are unrealized because it is profits from the change in prices of assets. Let me put it this way. So you are from Bloomberg. So if I buy Bloomberg shares for $100, and the share price of Bloomberg moves to $150, I have made a very decent profit of $50. But that remains a paper profit. It's unrealized. The only way I can realize that profit is to go into the market and sell my Bloomberg shares. And once I have sold my Bloomberg shares, I can then sit pretty with $50. But I no longer have Bloomberg shares. They're gone. So whatever happens with the $50, uh, I can't keep on saying I have this. I no longer have the $50. The profits in GFECRA are unrealized. For you to realize them, you must sell the underlying assets. So what are the assets there? Well, it's foreign exchange and it's gold, and it might be some forwards and swaps that we had written. The only way to realize the profits is you either sell the gold, or you sell the forex, or you settle the swaps or forwards, or some combination of three. And once you had done so, then you have the profit, and then you can start a discussion about what you do with the profit. The figure fluctuates, but for now, let's just work with the 500 billion because that's what everybody talks about. Let's work with the 500 billion. If we are to realize that 500 billion and make it into a real profit, for now, for, let's just assume that the exchange rates that are there, we have got the dollar, the euro, all of them combined, and the pound, and so forth. Just work on some figure, call it 20 rands. That basically means that at 20 rands to the pound or whatever, the dollar, whatever the thing is, it's 500 billion, $20. You have got to sell $25 billion of underlying assets. Our reserves are circa $60 billion. That means you have sold $25 billion of reserves, and you are now left with $35 billion of reserves. And somebody is going to say, hmm, they will they be able to settle their foreign currency denominated debt? Will they be able to pay for uh, imports? Um, if they experience a massive capital outflow, will they be able to meet their obligations? I don't think so. I am running for the hills, and you might then have a bonds and from the foreign exchange and so forth. That is the one. That's, that, that's what you have. The current situation, which is sit on it, it's zero. It's not sustainable either. There must be an answer in between somewhere. That is the conversation that the SAP and the uh, Reserve Bank is having. But realizing the profits by selling reserves is one. There is another one that uh, can be uh, pursued, uh, which um, I don't, I'm not sure how palatable uh, it would be. Uh, uh, the Reserve Bank prints money. Prints money, write a check to uh, the treasury, says, here is your money. Once the Reserve Bank has done that, the Reserve Bank has got to restore liquidity. 
and at 500 billion rands, and a repo rate of 8.25%. Do the arithmetic. That is how much we would need permanently going forward to service the liquidity in the financial system. Our capital is around 20 billion rands. That means we are into negative equity right there. And so once that is done, what do you do? The Reserve Bank must be recapitalized. Who is going to recapitalize? The taxpayers. Who are the taxpayers represented by? The Treasury. So we'll go and knock at the door of the Treasury and say, recapitalize. And the National Treasury will say, but on the queue, we have got social grants, we have got ESCOM, we have got Transnet, we have got this SOE, we have got this SOE. You chaps stand in the queue. Give us the thing. I don't think that the Reserve Bank would like to be in that position. So the mechanisms that are going to have to be worked would necessarily have to entail having to deal with the capital position of the bank. We are engaged with the Treasury. We also have brought in international expertise to engage on this uh, uh, on these matters, the issue is not that simple. And the notion that things, there is some pot of gold hidden in the Reserve Bank, that all that is needed is to figure out how to get into that uh, pot of gold, and bingo, our problems are solved, is very, very simplistic. At worst, is actually very reckless in terms, of, uh, in terms of policy. So that is uh, Jifekra. Um, but Mr. Jifekra, the, you've been to, you, you're good. OK. The current, am current amount is 497. 497. Give or take uh, between friends $3 billion, I mean, rents, <laughs> 3 billion rents. OK. You got that current amount, 497 billion. It, 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 it changes. Uh, and uh, there are months where this thing moves by 25, 50 billion rents at the time. And, uh, it's, it, and because it depends on the prices of all of those underlying assets. It's not a very straightforward, simple uh, matter. And Ntokozo. Um, mm. Competition Commission, rent manipulation. If the Competition Commission is busy with an inquiry on rent manipulation, the question should correctly be directed at the Competition Commission and not the Reserve Bank. But for the benefit, uh, for your benefit, let me say the following. In 2001, South Africans believed that some chaps are sitting somewhere conspiring against us to weaken the rent. These chaps were conspiring somewhere to weaken the rent. And in 2002, we launched a commission of inquiry into the rapid depreciation of the rent. You can Google it. You'll find it on the website of the Department of Justice. It's a thick report, otherwise known as the Maybeck report. Before the commission could come to an end, a bank approached the Reserve Bank with a, an offer of a settlement. And the settlement was that the transactions they entered into will be unwound, and the profits they had made would be forfeited. The difference between that inquiry and the inquiry of the Competition Commission is that that inquiry dealt with bridges of exchange control regulations. That is why the Reserve Bank was involved, because it was bridges of exchange control regulations. 
for completeness, in 2009-10, the rent was appreciating. South Africans believed that somebody is conspiring against us to make the rent so strong and make the life of South African exporters a living hell. No commission of inquiry was called then. In 2015, we picked up globally that there were reports of market abuse by institutions in various markets. For your benefit, if you remember, in the UK there was the libel uh, manipulation uh, issue. And there were concerns also in the foreign exchange, uh, the foreign exchange markets. We decided that we are going to start making inquiries. And we asked the former senior deputy governor of the Reserve Bank, Mr. James Cross, to lead a process to establish whether there were uh, any abuses. That report is available on the South African Reserve Bank website. Amongst its key recommendations was that we must develop a code for the foreign exchange market in South Africa. As we were trying to develop that code, we established that the BIS was working on a global code. South Africa joined that process of developing the global code. And we didn't just say that we have adopted the code, we actually pledged our commitment to the code. That pledge is on the website of the South African Reserve Bank. We are not the only ones. Many other central banks around the world have done a pledge of a similar nature. Whilst we were busy with that inquiry, the Competitions Commission approached us and said to us, that they have picked up news from the author for some foreign authorities that amongst the global manipulation of alleged manipulation of exchange rates is also a rent dollar pay. And based on that, they are embarking on an, a process of inquiry. They approached us and asked us for assistance because we are in the foreign exchange market. We spent hours and hours with them. We provided them with all the assistance they require. Should they require any further assistance from us, they will get it. But they are the competent authority to investigate any allegations of market abuse, abuse or market manipulation. They must be given the space to do their work and follow their processes, and we should not be burdening them with asking for running commentary. They are the competent authority on these matters. That's all I could assist you with. Beyond that, you are not going to get any other comment from the South African Reserve Bank. Governor Tembile Gere from Bloomberg again. I'm going to push my luck and please ask if you are willing to share the name uh, or names of the international experts that you've roped in uh, in your discussion with uh, National Treasury over Chief Ekra. Thank you. You will, uh, you will get them when we come out with a report. Thank you. Okay. Online. Thank you, Governor. Um, we have three questions from online two of which are related. The first two questions are from Sipelele Zuda at Business Report. He would like the governor to give a, an, an overall impression of the monetary policy for 2023, given that the MPC increased rates by 25 basis points to 7.25 in January, when the inflation was around 7%, but has kept rates higher at 8.25, when inflation is around 6%. His second question, Governor, can the Governor also clarify the statement he made at the PSG Think Big series last month about interest rates not affecting the unemployed because no one borrowed them money? A number of crit 
critics said the governor was ignoring the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. The last question, Governor, is from Atol Zamini at Alliance News. This is your last scheduled MPC meeting for 2023. How would you sum up your efforts to bring down inflation this year and since November 2021? What does this mean for your inflation fight going forward? Thank you, Governor. Those are all the questions. Uh, thank, you ver thank you very much. I think the first question is very much related to, mm. uh, to the second uh, uh, question. Um, understand that monetary, uh, inflation peaked at 7.8% in July 2022. We started tackling inflation from November 2021. Uh, we saw that uh, inflation was coming down at a pedestrian pace, remained outside our target for a protracted period of time. It eventually returned within target, declined towards the midpoint of the inflation target range, and we have seen now two months where the three months where the inflation ticked up from 4.7 to 4.8 from 4.8 to 5.4 from 5.4 to now uh, 5.9 the inflation outcome for 2023 is going we expect it to be 5.8 if it comes out at 5.8 it will be less than what we expected inflation to be at the beginning of the year um Rates were at a particular level in January, and inflation was at a particular level in January. Not very useful uh, because you do not set interest rates to deal with yesterday's inflation, neither do you set interest rates to deal with today's inflation. You set interest rates to deal with future uh, inflation. So the things that you have talked about uh, are not uh, comparable. Look at what the outlook is. That is what we uh, we uh, 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 we deal with, okay, and that has dealt with the interest rates uh, uh, as well. Um, and uh, the PSG thing, you know, I I I have read a couple of your your uh, uh, um, re the reports from your uh, publication. Uh, speak to my media team; they will give you a link of the video clip that sets out the entire context so that you understand it in full instead of relying on a short clip posted on social media. Let's be clear. All of us here gets affected. If you are a borrower or a saver, a saver, you are affected by interest rates. If you are a saver, the higher the interest rates, they benefit you. If you are a borrower, the lower the interest rates uh, benefit you, the answer lies in between because we are the central bank. We must intermediate between borrowers and savers. When inflation goes up, it affects all of us. Rich, poor, employed, unemployed. So let's get it clear. Any development strategy that would say that we should tolerate high inflation and have low interest rates because inflation does not matter. Such a development strategy is anti-poor. The South African Reserve Bank stands ready to protect the poor against the ravages of inflation, and we treat our price stability mandate seriously. That concludes the proceedings for today. Have a uh, happy uh, holidays. Merry Christmas, uh, happy new year. We'll see you in January uh, back in the same room. Thank you.